We are back and we are joined by the uh, always lovely uh, friend of the show, Mark Joseph Stern, uh, who is here to update us on the uh, horror that is the Supreme Court. Although we do have some good news today. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Emma. Sure. So uh, let's start with the good. Like we're going to do the good, the bad, the ugly here. Uh, K- Katanji Brown Jackson flexed her muscle here as a public defender in this case, McAlrath versus Georgia. Um, that's exciting because, you know, she's obviously the first public defender to sit on the Supreme Court and one of the best Supreme Court picks uh, over the past few decades, in, in my opinion. So uh, what happened in this case and, and why was her background as a uh, as a public defender so central? Yeah, this is such an interesting case. Uh, It involves both double jeopardy and the right to a jury trial um, and came out of Georgia where this guy tragically uh, basically became schizophrenic, stabbed his adoptive mother to death. Everyone agrees that's what happened. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. There were a couple of charges related to murder. On one of those charges, the jury found him not guilty by reason of insanity. On the other charge, the jury found him guilty, but insane. And under Georgia law, those are two different verdicts. One is an acquittal and one is a conviction. And so the Georgia courts looked at that and said, we don't think this guy can be insane and not insane at the same time. We don't think he can be guilty and not guilty at the same time. So we're going to throw out this verdict and we're going to allow allow him to be retried there should well, be alarm Mark, bells I, going off can now. i stop you there yeah i <laughs> yeah. just need, but but they i mean he, he was deemed insane in both in- instances right so but just the outcome was different that seems to be i don't understand why georgia law set it up that way i guess that's largely irrelevant but they took it as a an innocent plea on its face or an innocent finding on its face or a not guilty finding on its face Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a weird way that Georgia law divides this. Um, I mean, an acquittal is an acquittal. uh, But if you're acquitted for being insane, you're sentenced to a mental hospital. If you're convicted, but insane, you're sent to a prison. So there's an important distinction there. Um, And the Georgia courts looked at it and basically said, you know, it can't be both at the same time. You're either guilty or you're acquitted and overturned the convictions and allowed this guy to be retried on both of the charges, including the charge for malice murder on which he was acquitted. Um, And that is pretty much the definition of double jeopardy, right? The whole point of the double jeopardy principle is that you can't be retried when you've been acquitted. And the Georgia courts got around that by saying, well, we just don't think this verdict made sense. Basically, we don't think the jury knew what it was doing. It probably misunderstood the law. So we're just going to uh, send this back and allow for a retrial, double jeopardy, be be damned. And that was what Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson took issue with and said, we absolutely cannot do this. On its face, it seems clearly like a violation of the Fifth Amendment and uh, the the uh, the double jeopardy clause, essentially. Um, she was able to she wrote the majority opinion, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And, and and what was the outcome? I mean, how did the rest of the judges rule here? Yeah. So she actually wrote a unanimous opinion, which kind of surprised me because I listened to oral arguments and it, it did not seem like it was going to lead to a unanimous outcome. But it did. Uh, we can assume that Chief Justice John Roberts assigned the opinion to Justice Jackson. And I think she really brought something to the table here because she was not only a former public defender, but an appellate public defender. And so she represented people who had already been convicted who were contesting their appeals. And so she brought a lot of insight into this always kind of murky question of why a jury does what it does. You know, there are a lot of reasons why a jury can vote to acquit. We're all told on like TV and in movies that the jury finds someone not guilty because they haven't had, you know, all of the facts proved beyond a reasonable doubt. But as Justice Jackson noted, and I think like she dealt with some of these cases in her practice, a jury can acquit for literally any reason or no reason at all. Um, We talk sometimes about jury nullification. That is when a jury decides that, you know, I just don't think that this is a, a just case, a just prosecution. We don't think the underlying conduct should be criminal. If a jury makes that call, a jury gets 
to acquit. If a jury doesn't like the way that the law shakes out or doesn't even fully understand the way that a law shakes out, it can still vote to acquit. And no matter why the jury reaches that verdict, it is unreviewable by a higher court. It is a bedrock principle that a higher court simply cannot reject or review or overturn an acquittal. And it was interesting to me, you know, the Georgia Supreme Court had unanimously just sort of refused to accept that. Um, Georgia Supreme Court, a lot of former prosecutors, often has a kind of prosecutorial bias, didn't show a lot of respect for the jury and seemed to say, again, like, you know, the jury didn't know what it was doing, so we're just gonna send this back. Justice Jackson came in and she said, no, 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 the jury knows what it's doing by definition. That is the right. whole point of double jeopardy. When a jury acquits, it has acquitted, and that is the end of the story. And so I think just beneath the surface of this case really is this issue of jury nullification. And Justice Jackson went out of her way to talk about how a jury can acquit for reasons of compassion, for reasons of lenity, because a jury just doesn't want a conviction for whatever reason. And that is really important to reaffirm because, you know, Juries are the one thing standing between somebody like this poor schizophrenic defendant and all of the might of the state. Um, I, they're actually still pretty important, even though most cases don't go to a jury trial. And this was a very strong reaffirmation telling lower courts like the Georgia Supreme Court, don't mess around with this. Don't try to create these kind of technical uh, end runs around double jeopardy. It's not going to stand by us. Yeah, I mean, and uh, it's interesting too because some of these conservative courts they're more punitive and and I'm, I'm reminded of the supreme court's decision on the voting rights act where they've decided that it's in their purview to uh make determinations about what's in the minds and hearts of the people that are making these kinds of decisions and so that in that instance that was uh oh well we were afraid congress was afraid of coming off as racist and that's why they re-upped the the voting rights act right right, right. So, i mean so it's just incredible that like these these people who are textualists or identify as such spend so much of their uh, uh, time determining what's in the hearts and minds of of, of those who pass these uh, pass these bills or laws. That is a really good point. At least now we have a rule affirmed by Justice Jackson that you're not allowed to look into the hearts and minds of jurors. If they acquit, that's the end of the story. With the Voting Rights Act, it's a different case, but we'll deal with that yes, later. Yes, we can deal with that later. Um, so I guess the other good news was the fact that the Supreme Court decided not to hear this second um, uh, affirmative action case uh, out of uh, about this Virginia magnet school, uh, or, or did they hear it? I'm sorry if I if I have this one mixed up. No, you got it right. That's exactly it. The okay. court refused to take up this case called um, Coalition for TJ. It's about a magnet school in Virginia called Thomas Jefferson, and it's a really uh, competitive school. They have had a lot of trouble in the past uh, drawing in underrepresented racial minorities, specifically Black and Hispanic students. Um, and so what the admissions uh, officers decided to do was rather than enact a race conscious policy, they enacted a completely race blind policy. So you, they didn't even know the applicant's race, but they adjusted their criteria to try to bring in more of these underrepresented students. So most notably, um, they allowed or, or held spots uh, for students who came from middle schools that underperform, middle schools from often segregated neighborhoods, right? Middle schools with poor teachers. They said, we think that students who are able to excel at those schools should have a place at our school because they've proven against all odds, you know, that 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 they can actually put in the work and that they're bright and, and deserve a spot here. And uh, there was a, a big challenge brought by, I mean, really it was white people, but they claimed to have been representing Asian Americans at the right. school. They claimed that the policy discriminated against Asian Americans. The appeals court rejected that and pointed out, this seems like very important, that the, the new admissions policy did not actually significantly reduce the number of Asian Americans at the school did not uh, mean that Asian Americans uh, didn't still attend in large numbers. It just meant that there were also more black students there. And the, the argument being pressed to the Supreme Court was basically, you know, it doesn't really matter if Asian American students are still competitive at this school. The fact that the admissions policies were changed to promote diversity is inherently unconstitutional. And, and uh, that is uh, a, a an interesting decision not to take that up because 
The Supreme Court just dealt a significant blow to affirmative race-based affirmative action when it came to universities. Was this was the basis of this uh, in any way touching upon the fact that this was a high school uh, versus a, a, a college? What was the reasoning? So, look, we don't know exactly why the Supreme Court took up the case. Um, I think that might have been one reason the rules are different for high schools versus colleges. But I, I also think it would have been one hell of a bait and switch for the Supreme Court to take up this case and to strike down the new admissions policy. Because in that affirmative action decision uh, from last term, the majority specifically said we are not uh, obliterating or prohibiting race neutral criteria and admissions right. that, that are designed to bring in more diversity. And in fact, like the people who invented this whole scheme were Republicans, George W. Bush, created the top 10% plan in Texas as governor because he knew that it would bring in more black and Hispanic students into the state's colleges. Like this whole premise of using non-racial factors to bring in uh, racial minorities, this was pioneered by Republicans as an alternative to affirmative action. The court has blessed it repeatedly. And yet the plaintiffs in this case tried to kill it before it even got a chance to take off, really. And so I, I think that partly maybe some of the justices, including John Roberts, who wrote that terrible affirmative action decision, recognized that like to strike down this policy would be to go back on everything the court has ever said about this exact approach to increasing diversity. Like this is what the court had said it wanted. So how could it possibly come in now and say, actually, we changed our minds. It's unconstitutional. Yeah, I mean, and that's also it seems like it's also in keeping with what uh, Roberts has been doing in terms of trying to maybe help the public relations as it relates to the Supreme Court at this point um, and, and not be so activist on their own on its face. But what was the bad news here? I saw uh, you write about this was Sam Alito seems to be very eager and signaling that he's quite eager to uh curtail um, anti-discrimination uh, towards LGBTQ people in the country. He wrote this opinion in Missouri Department of Corrections versus Finney. Uh, what happened there uh, uh, earlier in the week, Mark? Yeah, I mean, Sam Alito was on a tear on Tuesday. He also dissented in this affirmative action case. He wrote this really quite personal screed attacking the Biden judge who wrote the lower court opinion. He said the judge's reasoning was a virus that would spread. And it, it was very strange. But he also wrote this opinion in, in the case you mentioned. Um, this should not have been a Supreme Court case at all. Uh, what happened was there was a lesbian who worked for the Missouri state government. She faced discrimination. She filed a lawsuit. During voir dire, the attorney uh, for this plaintiff, a lesbian, asked the jurors basically, how many of you were taught or believe that being gay is sinful? Some of them raised their hands. He said, okay, how many of you think that that belief could interfere with your ability to render a fair judgment. Some of them kept their hands up. He questioned three of them and they effectively said homosexuality is a sin. It's sinful. It says they're right in the Bible. Like I believe that God decreed homosexuality is wrong. And then sort of said, but you know, in this case I, I should be able to judge fairly. I just think that all gay people are sinful and essentially <laughs> going to hell. Uh, the lawyer struck those jurors. The court affirmed that strike. Uh, the 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 plaintiff actually won a pretty big uh, payout in damages, which is great, relatively rare. Um, the state appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court turned away the appeal, which is great. But Sam Alito wrote this separate opinion saying that, in effect, it violated the First Amendment rights of those anti-gay jurors to question and remove them from the jury for their belief that the plaintiff in the case is inherently sinful and engages in and lives a sinful lifestyle. Okay, uh, ew, I, I've got to jump in for a sec. The, the prosecutors and, 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 and defense attorneys can kick someone off a jury for anything, right? Like, I mean, a lot of the jury selection is strategy by the prosecutors or the defense attorneys, too, where they vet people. I mean, say if you have too strong of an opinion on X, Y, and Z, or your politics may interfere with some... Uh, uh, 
some particular case, they have wide discretion to kind of basically uh, put stack the jury in a way that they feel might be, you know, beneficial to their case. So the fact that, as you say, this even reached the Supreme Court is clearly a, a just a, a, a way to warm the bench to uh, go after LGBTQ people again and tease up Alito to put this opinion out there. Absolutely. Um, and, and as a signal to, I think, other lower courts that are more extreme than Missouri's to to try to press this issue. Uh, of course, lawyers and trial court judges strike jurors for strongly held beliefs about all kinds of things every single day around the country. You yeah. believe strongly that the criminal justice system is racist. You believe strongly that uh, tort reform is important to control medical costs. You believe strongly that, uh, you know, fill in the blank. You have a strong belief, you get struck. All the time it happens. What Alito is trying to do is establish a special privilege specifically for anti-gay bigots where they are not allowed to be struck because their beliefs are cloaked in the garb of religious belief and religious faith and doctrine. And it would be another effort. I mean, he's been doing this for a while, right. not only to grant special privileges to, to anti-gay Christians, but also to really undermine the right to marriage equality itself. I mean, he begins this opinion not even by talking about the case at hand, but by complaining about marriage equality, complaining that the Supreme Court legalized marriage equality, complaining that it had led to all of these horrible consequences, treating anti-gay Christians as bigots. And I think that's, I mean, again, his sort of creed de cur in multiple opinions over the years since the marriage equality decision in 2015, where he's saying we have to overturn marriage equality because it is abridging the First Amendment rights of homophobes. Yes. And so I guess this is the preview for uh, p part of why uh, this is bad and not ugly at this point is just because it just is a an indicator of what's coming down the right. uh, the pike here. The ugly is this good neighbor EPA situation. It seems like the Supreme Court is poised to strike down this Clean Air Act provision based on what I'm reading, Mark, but I'm curious what your perspective is reporting on the Supreme Court. Can you explain what it is and what it looks like the judges might do here? Yeah, I, I agree with the consensus that it's bad news for the EPA. So this is, um, it, it's called the good neighbor rule. It's enshrined into federal law. The basic problem here is that there are a bunch of states that are upwind, that have a lot of heavy industry, that produce various emissions, including ozone emissions, um, which are quite bad for the environment, for human health, for pretty much everybody. And the downwind states, usually to the south or to the east, are the ones that suffer. It just so happens in a kind of perverse twist of fate that the upwind states tend to be red states and the downwind states tend to be blue states. So like all of the industry and pollution happens in red states and then the fallout happens in blue states. Right. So the Biden administration came in with this plan to try to limit ozone uh, pollution in these upwind states. Again, basically red states. A bunch of the states filed suit. Federal courts blocked the plan in, I think, 11 of those states, but didn't block the plan in the remaining 12 states. So you have like half of a plan remaining. Those 12 states then went to the Supreme Court, joined by the polluters, saying, well, now you have to block the entire thing. And the Supreme Court is almost certainly going to do so. I mean, we could talk about this for hours, like the reading of federal law here that the states are, are putting forth is so absurd. The states are basically saying, we get to implement this law however we want, and if it doesn't actually reduce ozone and downwind pollution, it's not our fault or our problem. But the, the I think the sort of perverse irony of the Supreme Court case is that the argument is, well, it's already been blocked in 11 states. So it might as well be blocked in the remaining 12 states, which means that the whole legal problem here was created by other federal courts blocking part of the plan. And now the Supreme Court is going to ride in on its horse at the last minute and block the plan in the other 12 states, meaning that there will be no plan at all and ozone will be largely unregulated. It's just another instance of the Roberts Court playing really fast and loose with environmental regulations and sort of manipulating the law and its own docket to do whatever it can to ensure that industry can pollute pretty much as, as much as it wants.
So if I'm understanding you correctly, they're using the fact that federal courts blocked some of this in other states as a way to say, well, we're basically being discriminated against, even though if those courts had not blocked it, the law would have applied equally to everybody. That is exactly right. OK, that's it's insane. And it's going to get six <laughs> votes on the Supreme because Court. If they, because if they just said, no, this applies everywhere, the problem would be solved. The, 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 the central basis of their claim of it being unfair would be completely eliminated, and then it could just be federal law. Right. Their, their whole claim is, well, these other states don't have to do it, so we shouldn't have to do it now. And six justices are going to say, no, now the EPA has to go back to the drawing board. It has to redo all of the math. It has to open up comments for all the states, basically kicking the can another year or two down the road. It's just, I mean, it's almost sort of Trumpist in, in the effort to manipulate the courts to sort of run out the clock on a policy. That's what's going on here. There's very little true law involved. Uh, lastly on this um is this a is this a preview of further attacks on the epa in particular absolutely and, and i think what's especially troubling about this case is that it came to the court in a very weird posture so the industry groups joined by these uh 12 other states they filed an emergency application to the Supreme Court before their case had been fully litigated at the lower court, at the DC Court of Appeals. So the DC Court of Appeals has not actually rendered like a judgment in this case, but the t states and the polluters ran up to SCOTUS and said, don't make us wait, please don't make us wait. We want relief right now. And so SCOTUS jumped in before it even has a real record, before it even has a, a lower court decision just to aid and abet the desires of these red states and industry groups. And uh, that is just not how the appellate process works. Like this is something that basically never happened happened before Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett joined the bench. It's another kind of shadow docket mischief thing where the court is using this supermajority to take up these cases prematurely to do an end run around the actual appellate process and to help out the parties that they want to help out, polluters and Republicans here, uh, before they have any right to even step foot at the Supreme Court. Well, uh, we uh, maybe we should have ended on the good news. I don't know, but we started in, uh, we started in the way that we did. So, um, Mark, I really, really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for coming on, and always good to see you. Thanks so much for having me, Emma. For sure.